Hello, today we're just going to learn the background of sines. Um, many of you probably have some background knowledge of this from all your years of science class and also just um, being a curious, naturally curious person that lives on Earth. Um, what are the goals of science? So we're trying to figure out how, you know, how things work around us. So again, something that you've done since you were probably actually even a baby, you just couldn't verbalize it, um, trying to figure out how things work around you. So in science, we're going to use um, natural patterns that are used to make predictions for things that we might not totally know already as of yet. Um, when you're looking at biology and, and a lot of science in general, um, we're constantly learning new things. So things that we learned before um, isn't going to be like true all the time. Things are constantly changing um, with new um, revelations coming out with, um, you know, since technology is getting more and more advanced. Um, so we don't like to um, think that once we learn something that that's the end all be all, it could possibly slightly change based on getting new information. So we would revise what we previously um, discovered to fit in with the new information that was learned. Um, so their uh, scientific ideas are open to testing, discussion, and revision constantly. Um, a scientist, again, um, how they work is they're going to collect and organize their information in an orderly way. They're going to be making observations, asking questions, testing those questions, looking for patterns and connections among events. So that's how they do find their findings. Um, key thing is that um, scientists are going to propose their explanations and people should do this in society based on evidence, not just belief or story. So we try to steer away from anecdotal um, anecdotal stories that like, oh, well, I think um, I shouldn't get the flu shot because my, you know, sister's husband um, got the flu really bad one time when he got the flu shot. So um, based on evidence, the flu shot helps to combat the current flu that's going around that season. Um, that's why it's usually um, recommended to take it. So things like that, we try to stay away from anecdotal stories. Um, even though we know a lot of information about science and the world around us, there's still a ton that we don't know yet. Um, so that's why it's very important that we have um, a good science education here to get more and more people involved with science because again we have lots of things that we still need to figure out and discover. Um, this constant change shows that science continues to advance. Um, science rarely proves anything in absolute terms. We just get a better understanding more and more especially when technology advances um, to how things work around us. Um, Science has allowed us to build enough understanding to make useful predictions about the natural world. So um, kind of to go with our class here, you guys are probably going to be asking some really great questions. I might not know all the answers. You, um, so what, a lot of times maybe we'll go look on the internet to see if there's actually an answer that's out there. There might not be an answer for the questions that you guys have that even PhD scientists don't know. Um, so that's just the nature of science. There's still a lot of things that we don't know out there yet. Um, what procedures are done in scientific methodology? So a lot of this that you probably have done just being a curious um, person here on earth, asking, you know, making lots of observations, asking questions. So you um, probably did this a lot ever since you were a toddler. Um, we're gonna talk about making what things called inferences and hypotheses are, what a controlled experiment is, and how we would like you to collect and analyze data and to draw conclusions. Um, an observation is the act of noticing, describing events or processes in a careful and orderly way. So observations, you notice um, the leaves turn red or orange in the fall. Um, you've probably noticed all sorts of things around you um, as you've been growing up. Um, this observation will lead to a question. So um, why do the leaves turn orange or red in the fall? Um, here in this example here, we have two locations, A and B. Um, this marsh area, 
we're noticing the observations that there's different growth in the both areas. Question would be, well, why do the grasses grow, grow at different heights in these different places? Um, from here, you'd make probably an inference um, based on your prior knowledge, some sort of interpretation um, as to why the observation is happening. Um, with this inference and your observation, you're going to form a hypothesis, which is a testable um, statement, a testable question or a scientific explanation for a set of observations that can be tested in ways that support or reject it. So here, um, they're going to hypothesize, and you'll probably see this on the next slide, that if there's um, different amounts of nitrogen, if, um, if you increase the amount of nitrogen in the area, then the marsh is going to grow more. So a lot of times a hypothesis will form an if-then statement, um, like a cause and effect type of statement. Um, so here again, the nitrogen um, hypothesis. When you're setting up an experiment, we often, especially in biology, set up a controlled experiment. That is where you are only affecting one variable at a time. So for example, the salt marsh, you can change the amount of water, sunlight, nitrogen that they talked about, but for a controlled experiment, you'd only want to change one of those. So you'd want to keep the amount of like water and the amount of sun exposure um, the same amongst all the different groups that you're testing. Um, so that would be known as a controlled experiment where you're only changing one variable at a time to really see if that's the variable that's um, causing the effect. In chemistry next year, you probably might not always have a controlled experiment because we're just kind of interested to in seeing how um, a chemical reaction works. So you don't necessarily need a controlled experiment for that. When you're controlling variables, there's um, two main variables that you are working with in um, a controlled ex um, experiment. One is called the independent variable, which is also known as the manipulated variable. This is the variable that you're interested in testing to see if it actually has an effect. So that's why we say manipulated variable. You are manipulating it. So I like to remember an independent variable is I change the variable. So the one that I am actually manipulating to see, to test, to see if it has an effect. So in that salt marsh experiment, can we guess what the independent variable is? If you guess that the independent variable was the amount of nitrogen, then you would be correct. Um, so they're gonna see if the amount of nitrogen affects um, the marsh. Um, the dependent variable is the variable which is gonna respond to that independent variable that you um, tested. So the dependent variable, again, um, responds to that um, independent variable. I like to remember the dependent variables like your results, the data that you're going to measure. So dependent and data, they both start with the D. Nice way to remember that. So in the salt marsh, can we remember what the dependent variable may be? If you guess that the dependent variable would be the growth in the salt marsh, then you would be correct. So the, the growth of the grasses in the salt marsh is going to be responding to the amount of nitrogen that you manipulated. Um, in an experiment, a lot of times you'll have a control group, again, more so your bio biologically based experiments. Um, a control group would be the, um, a group in your experiment where you do not apply the independent or manipulated variable to. Um, you're keeping it at the same conditions as it was when you found it. Um, and then you're gonna have an experimental group or experimental groups that have that independent variable, that manipulated variable. So like we would have one group um, that had no nitrogen, which would be your control group. And then you'd have different experimental groups that had various amounts of nitrogen. So you're gonna, the, the whole point of a control group is to use as a comparison to see, well, did the independent variable or did the various amounts of nitrogen actually affect the growth? So you'd compare the control group that had no nitrogen to the other groups that had various amounts of nitrogen to see really did nitrogen affect the growth. So here, um, what we were just talking about um, on the previous slide about the control group versus experimental group in this um, situation with the salt marsh. Um, when you're collecting and analyzing data, so you ran your experiment, you're gonna get your data, um, your results. Um, you can record data as quantitative data or qualitative data. So the difference here, quantitative, is um, 
record information with the numbers. So think quantitative, quantity, quantity means numbers. Um, so here you would probably, you know, measure the, the growth in centimeters. Um, you can count how many um, number of plants per plot, plant size, growth rate, so all number based. Qualitative is using descriptions involving words, characteristics that usually can't be counted with numbers. Um, this might be like um, if there were sworn objects on the plot, whether the grass is growing upright or sideways, maybe a color difference between the grasses and the two different groups. Um, so qualitative is like quali quality using words. So between the two, quantitative and qualitative, which one do you think is more accurate? If you guess quantitative, that's usually that's more accurate. Um, we all understand numbers all around the world. We know what it means. The experimental group grew um, 10 centimeters more than the control group. Um, if you use qualitative words like the the experimental group grew more than the qualitative group or than the control group, um, that's kind of subjective. We don't know if more means like one centimeter more or 100 centimeters more. So we try to steer you guys towards recording your information in quantitative terms. Um, when you're drawing a conclusion, again, you want to use evidence to support, refute, or revise your hypothesis. So when we say use data to support or reject, we are more specifically talking about quantitative data. So that's going to be something that we're going to really practice this year, using quantitative data to um, support um, a conclusion. When you're drawing a conclusion again, you're going to re um, get your data, you're going to um, analyze it, and usually what that what that will involve is that you're going to um, revise your hypothesis. Your hypothesis might have been kind of on the right track, but not totally correct, which that is actually what happens most often. It's rare that your hypothesis is absolutely correct. Um, many scientists spend their whole careers revising um, a hypothesis. So don't feel bad if your hypothesis is wrong. Most of the time, it might not be totally right. So we're looking more for, can you use data to revise a hypothesis rather than did your hypothesis end up being right? Sometimes experiments aren't possible. So for example, um, a setup like a control experiment. So for example, like animal behavior, um, you would usually do a field observation for that where you're gonna kind of see naturally how a certain animal that you're testing um, is responding to a certain stimuli, how they interact in a social group. Um, so you wouldn't set like a control or experimental group there. Um, you would just record observations and devise a hypothesis um, based on, and conclusion based on your data of observations. Other times also experiments aren't possible, especially when it comes for um, human-based experiments. Um, there's lots of ethical, um, Things that we have to keep in mind. So, for example, if you were, if you thought that something caused cancer, which is car a carcinogen, um, a certain substance that ca that causes cancer, you wouldn't purposely give people this carcinogen, this substance, um, to see if it did cause cancer. That would be ethically not sound. So, what we would do instead is find people that were already exposed to this certain carcinogen, uh, maybe at various amounts, to see if people that were exposed more to it, was there a higher incidence of cancer than those that weren't exposed or very minimally exposed? So there's ethical things that we have to keep in mind while doing experiments. All right, that is it for today. All right, thank you.